Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Job 34. We are in 2 Corinthians 4. And it's going to be a wonderful chapter. Job 34 is perplexing to me. I don't know mm. if it is to you, but it's perplexing to me. Poor old Job seems to be getting it now from Elihu. Mm. Um, it's going to get it even more tomorrow. Mm. Well, there we are. At least Elihu is defending God, but he's not doing a great job of being gentle with Job. Mm. Let's pray. We'll get into it. Father in heaven, we pray that you would please allow us to have insight. Please give us that insight that we need into your word. Teach us the truth. Mm. Help us to learn the lessons that we need to learn today. And, uh, please lead us and guide us and direct us and, and instruct us, correct us, equip us, prepare us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Job 34. Now, then Elihu answered and said hear my words you wise men and give ear to me you who know for the ear tests words as the palate tastes food let us choose what is right let us know among ourselves what is good for job has said i am in the right and god has taken away my right in spite of my right i am counted a liar my wound is incurable though i am without transgression now, hold on a minute. Did Job say, I am without transgression? Mm -hmm. No, he did not. He said the opposite of that several times. And in the beginning, we learn he was sacrificing. He made it clear that he was not without transgression. That wasn't his argument. And it just says to me again, look, how important is it when someone is speaking, to really try and understand things from their perspective, mm. to really try and listen. Mm. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and you get the impression that they're not really listening to you, they're just waiting to talk? Mm. And they're just like, you know, oh, is, it my turn? Is, it, is it my turn yet? Uh, yeah, 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 mm, mm, yeah. Mm. And they're just, not really actually listening to your argument and you think you've got an important point to make but they can't wait for you to stop talking so that they can make their point and they've already decided that you're wrong and that their point is going to prove you wrong and they're not listening to the point that you're making and you just think okay don't do that don't let's be job's counselors and that includes Elihu at this point. He's not really listening to Job carefully, is he? Mm. Now, despite that, he's about to quote Job, which means he is listening to Job up to a point, but he just doesn't listen properly. So verse 7, What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who travels in company with evildoers, and walks with wicked men? And you think, well, hold on a minute, how is Job doing that? Well, here's Elihu's argument. For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Not quite what Job said, is it? Job is saying, look, I'm delighting in God and this is happening to me. Why is this? What, what profit is there for me? And so you could kind of argue that he says that. But it wasn't quite Job's point. Verse 10 Therefore hear me, you men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. At least you could say Elihu is defending God at this point. For according to the work of a man will he will repay him, and according to his ways he will make it before him. <clears throat> of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over who gave him charge of over the earth? Who laid on him the whole world? If he should set his heart to it, 
and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Now, there's a truth. It's very interesting. When you read systematic theologies, do you know what a systematic theology is? A systematic theology is a book where the theologian says, now let me consider the subject of, hmm, let's say, God's immortality, um, God's eternal life, the eternality of God. And then he goes through the whole Bible and pulls out different verses and proves the doctrine that God lives forever and ever. Maybe talks about God being outside of time, and beyond time and before time and things like that. And makes a real study of it. When you do systematic theology, it's very interesting sometimes to see the systematic theologians pulling a verse out of Job, quoted by Bildad or Zophar. Mm. <laughs> this is one of those Job's that, this is one of those, this is one of those verses that systematic theologians do turn to. And I think they're right. You know, if God should set his heart to it and gather him to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. Now we get it from somewhere else, actually, Colossians, I think, upholding all things by the word of his power. What is that? Hebrews. Is it Colossians 1? Jesus actually holds everything together by the word of his power. I mean, if it, he stopped, everything would just fall apart. Thank you for looking at well, it. I'm pretty sure it is. And I'm pretty sure it's Colossians 1, but you never know. 16 or something, or 18. Uh, it'll probably be more like 18. <laughs> 17. 17. Well, we were, Between the we two were both wrong. <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay. So it's not quite that one. All things hold together. Mm. Oh, okay. Anyway, same idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, now, that's a good point, isn't it? Anyway, all things hold together. So, so you say Elihu's got it right here, um, but he doesn't all have it all right, does he? Mm. Anyway, if you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say, verse 16. 17, shall one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is righteous and mighty? Who says to the king, oh, who says to the king, worthless one, and to nobles, wicked man, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor? For they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die, and at midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand. For his eyes are on the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There's no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. For God has no need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. He shatters the mighty without investigation and sets others in their place. Thus, knowing their works, he overturns them in the night and they're crushed. He strikes them for their, for their wickedness in a place for all to see because they turned aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him and he heard the cry of the afflicted. When he is quiet... Who can condemn? When he hides his face, who can behold him? Whether it be a nation or a man, that a godless man should not reign, that he should not ensnare the people. For has anyone said to God, I have borne punishment, I will not offend any more. Teach me what I do not see. If I've done iniquity, I will do it no more. Will he then make repayment to you because you reject it? For you must choose and not I. Therefore, declare what you know. Men of understanding will say to me, and the wise man who hears me will say, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without insight. 
Would that Job were tried to the end, because he answers like wicked men. For he adds rebellion to his sin, he claps his hands among us, and multiplies his words against God. Wow, this is Elihu, really going for it, isn't he? So he's saying, I wish Job would really be like Job hasn't had enough. Right. I wish he really, would really be tried to the end. I wish God would really sort him out. Mm. Where's your compassion, Elihu? Mm. None of them have got much compassion, have they? Mm. It's really good, isn't it, that we have a high priest mm. who is touched with a feeling of our infirmity. Mm. What does that mean? He's... His, Jesus is someone who knows weakness. The Bible calls him a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The reason that God made high priests to be human in general was so that they could deal gently with sinners because they themselves were beset with weakness so when other people sin someone who speaks to God on your behalf needs to know what it's like to be tempted and really feel for your weakness and then they might kind of they're going to pray for you aren't they that's what an old testament priest would do they'd intercede with God on your behalf we pray and now we've got Jesus who is tempted in every point just like we are but without sin but he knows what it's like to be tempted seems to me that these counsellors of Job just don't seem to have any compassion for him mm. which is weird because they sat for seven whole days in silence appalled Maybe they were just appalled, thinking about, well, it could have been me. Instead of thinking, poor Job, really feeling for him. I don't know. It seems their compassion left them when they started trying to counsel him anyway. That's a warning, isn't it, to counsellors? It's a warning to people, to Christians, who would try to comfort each other. Do you remember we read this in... 2 Corinthians that we're reading now, mm. chapter 1, we, we are supposed to comfort one another with mm. the comfort with which we are comforted. Mm. But Job's comforters are miserable, aren't they? Mm. Because they're not comforting him. And they're just... They don't seem to be people who've been comforted themselves. Mm. They just seem to be people who are accusing him all the time. Anyway. There we are. We'll get there. God's going to speak soon. Meanwhile, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Mm. Now, where are we? 2 Corinthians. Okay, what's happening in 2 Corinthians? Paul is defending the apostleship. Fighting off the pirates. Quite so. Now... Whilst he's doing so, in chapter <laughs> 3, remember this yesterday? We all with unveiled faces. Hmm. Um, we're not like Moses. We're very bold, he says, not like Moses. But Moses would put a veil, a veil over his face so that the Israelites couldn't gaze at the glory that was reflected in Moses. It's shining from Moses' face connected with the old covenant. Paul says Moses was somehow timid, restrained. But we're very bold. We're not like Moses. We don't have to do that. We don't have to hide it. We just we can just let it shine because this wonderful new covenant is the full package. That old covenant was that which was not permanent. It was um, coming, being brought to an end, verse 11, and replaced by something which is permanent, the new covenant. So verse 1 in chapter 4, Therefore having this ministry, what ministry? Well, the ministry of 
the new covenant, being ministers of the new covenant, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Now, think about that for a second, because hold on a minute. What had Paul been saying in chapter 1 and 2? Oh, he got to the point where he was just so distressed, wasn't he? He couldn't bear it. He walked away from an open door of ministry that God had set before him. He walked away from it because he just had no peace, because he couldn't find Titus, and he was so anxious about the Corinthians and whether they'd been turned against him and whether all his labour would have been in vain and whether they would be broken by it all. And he was just... He was consumed by his concern for them. Now in verse 1 in chapter 4, he says, we don't lose heart because we have this ministry by the mercy of God. Mm. Verse 2, but we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. And that's probably what these super apostles were doing, practicing Mm. cunning and tampering with the word. But by contrast, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The open statement of the truth. Mm -hmm. Another way of translating that. Setting forth the truth plainly. Mm -hmm. So we just say what it is. And we say it like it is. We don't hide it. We don't cover it up. We don't take half an hour to say homosexuality is a sin. Someone asks us, so is homosexuality a sin? We just say, yes. (laughs) We don't have to apologise for it. We don't have to say, if someone says, how many genders are there? We just say, two. We don't have to say, oh, well, um, it depends upon your point of view, or you've got a very good point there, and and beat around the bushes. No, we just set forth the truth plainly. And in doing so, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. People know that what you're saying is right. Mm. When you beat around the bush, which has become popular, um, and pa- pastors go on national TV and get asked a straightforward question, and at the end of listening to their convoluted answer, all you can decide is with the fact that they didn't really want to say yes but eventually they had to (laughs) and you're like well if you don't want to say yes don't say yes (laughs) if you if you would rather not go the whole way and compromise no don't do that but it just is embarrassing isn't it you want people to just state it Anyway, there we are. Where where are we? Setting forth the truth plainly. I'm getting carried away here. I should move on. Verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled... Hold on a minute. A moment ago he was saying we all with unveiled faces. We don't do this. It's not veiled. But then he says even if it is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, so so how, how is the gospel veiled? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So this is not Moses putting a veil in front of the the glory of reflected glory from the presence of God in the Old Covenant. Mm. This is not Paul putting a veil in front of the Gospel. This is the God of this world, blinding the minds of unbelievers. So this is, this is, that's the only way in which you could say the Gospel is veiled, so people can't understand it and see it. Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, slaves, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give 
the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, I think Paul is just playing on this whole theme of shining faces because Moses' face is shone. And now he's saying God has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Mm. Because when we look at Christ, mm. we see the, the glory of God. That's so wonderful, isn't it? We don't have to hide that. God has shone that in our hearts. Now, that's quite the privilege, isn't it? Think of it. Do you, do you feel like you have a privilege here? Do you feel like, oh, God has actually revealed to me the glory of God in Jesus? Mm. You, you read the Gospels. Do you see the wonder of the fact that, okay, no one has ever seen God at any time, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The invisible God has been made, you would say, visible in the person of Jesus. We get to see God in Jesus. So if you know, Philip could say to Jesus, show us the Father and that will be enough, mm. enough for us, mm. Jesus could answer Philip and say, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In, in the letter to the Hebrews, it talks about Jesus being um, the radiance of God's glory. It talks about, in Colossians, Jesus being the exact representation of his being. So it's, this is like, this is, we see Jesus. Do you, do you see Jesus this way? Do you, do you read the Gospels? Do you read the Bible? And you see Jesus and you're like, that's what God is like. I love Jesus. I love this God. I see it. This is wonderful. This is the glory of God in Jesus. When Jesus touches the leper, I see the compassion and the mercy and the love of God for, for, for us wretched people, the untouchables touched by the compassionate God. When Jesus has time for people, do you... Do you get the impression that you're seeing something of the, the wonderful willingness, the mercy of God? When someone says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And all the disciples are saying, shut up. <laughs> and Jesus stops and goes back. And you, Can you see mm. the light of the glory? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is wonderful, isn't it? Do you have that? Okay. If you have it, you have what Paul had. And think of how much Paul had it, how much he saw that we don't see. Verse 7. But we have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of possessing this knowledge about Jesus. We have this treasure... In jars of clay. Ah. What do you mean, jars of clay? Yes. Inside us. Mm, we have it in our inside us, yes. But I think he's contrasting a jar of clay with maybe a stone pot. Or, I mean, if you wanted something to be really safe, you might put it in a pot that's been carved out of stone. How strong is a stone pot? Very strong, right? How strong is a clay pot? Clay pots were weak, unbreakable, disposable. Clay pots, yeah, you could bury treasure in them sometimes. But clay pots were used for rubbish. People didn't have flushing toilets in those days. So you know what they used? Mm -hmm. Clay pots. Now when a clay pot has been, had been used for that kind of stuff, did you then use it for cooking? Mm -hmm. No way. Perish the thought. Horrible, horrible, horrible thought. What did you do with it when you'd finished using it for that kind of stuff? You just broke it. 
just disposed of it. Cheap clay pot, buy them everywhere. There's a potter on every corner. Just throw it away. Okay. Paul is saying about himself, we have this treasure in cheap, disposable, breakable, fragile pots. That's us. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Mm -hmm. What do you mean the to show that? Well, look, now he's going to explain it. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're I'm going to put the words we are. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We, we are persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus might, may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. What's the point? The point is, look, Paul and his companions were going through the most terrible hardships, weren't they? They were really suffering. But they weren't crushed. They were hard breast on every side. It was like, I picture this, something like the scene in Star Wars where the crusher's coming in. You remember the walls are kind of compacting in and they're trying to brace the walls, you know. And the walls are coming in on the Christian and you're like, ah, oh, this is terrible, I'm being crushed, I'm being hard pressed on every side. Huh, but I'm not crushed. How come? Ah. Oh. It's not because someone managed to wedge something in between the crusher walls. It's because the hand of God is holding you and protecting you. It's a miracle. It's like, I should be finished now. I should, I should have cracked up. <laughs> I'm perplexed. <laughs> I'm perplexed, but I'm not driven to despair. Well, that doesn't make sense because Paul himself, think of it. By the way, sometimes people think, "Ah, oh, he was an apostle, so he always knew what he was. He always knew what was happening. He had a, he had a telephone line to heaven." Well, actually, Paul was often perplexed. In other words, he didn't know what to do. Take that and get some comfort from it. You're not alone, but not forsaken, struck down, mm. but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the dying death, the death of Jesus. So, so that's what it's like to be a faithful Christian, is you suffer. Is you're, you're stretched, you're squashed, you're, com you're perplexed, you're, but you're persecuted but not forsaken. So, so it seems to be all going wrong. But then somehow God shows that he's with you. And when he shows that he's with you, it proves that the power comes from him and not from us. That's the point. So verse 13, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke, we also believe, and so we also speak. Now, just take that, connect it to what was said earlier about setting forth the truth plainly. Mm -hmm. This is speaking based on what you, you are truly convinced about. You speak because you believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. You speak because you can't do anything else but say, I believe this. Can you imagine one of those New Testament Christians, mm -hmm. little girls like Blandina, being told to deny Jesus. And she's just like, I can't do that. I can't deny Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. S say Caesar is Lord. I can't say Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord. We're going to throw you to the lions. Well, I can't say Jesus is... I can't say Caesar is Lord. You have to throw me to the lions then. The lions wouldn't touch her. We're going to get the bulls out. Yeah, well, I'll just... 
not deny Jesus. All the people put to the stake and with the fire is brought and they're ready to put it to the wood. Will you deny Jesus now? I can't deny Jesus. Like Athanasius, 84 years, he's been faithful to me. How can I deny him now? You know, that's, that's what it's like. Persecuted but not forsaken. Being willing to speak because you really believe it. That's what Paul had. Now, how do you get to there? Look at verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus mm-hmm. and bring us with you into his presence. So, so you can be bold like Blandina. <laughs> you can be just unashamed in, in your witness and speak like the Apostle Paul if you know that he who raised Jesus will raise you. What a thing. Is that the cat? <laughs> all right, we've only got a few more verses and then we can let her in. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So Paul saw all his sufferings as God allowing it for their sake. Isn't that wonderful? So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, this is one of my favourite verses in the whole Bible, as I groan out of bed in the mornings. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Isn't it true as you read the Bible every day? Your inner nature is renewed if you're a believer. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Mm. Well, there's there's a verse to wake up to tomorrow. What do you think? Look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Lord, we pray that you'd help us like this, to fix our eyes on things that are unseen, on things above, on eternal things, not to be all caught up, in the things of this world. Lord, be merciful. Please bless and help us to glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're done. You made me a cup of tea and I never drank it. Thank you. (laughs) Where's she gone? So I'm sure she'll be back. We'll say goodbye. God bless you. We'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. (laughs) She made it. We made it.